Hello friends, it's Steve from Southern Illinois again, and it's a droopy day down here. Um, we'll try to uh, get our conversation over before the showers come, but uh, I've got an umbrella down here just in case, so don't be surprised if I pull it out. So, what does it mean to be a savior? Well, that's obvious, Steve. That means you saved someone, you rescued them, you... Um, <clears throat> brought them back from the brink of death, you defended them. But what does it take to be a savior? That's the question I really want us to consider today. We had an object lesson in that last week. Um, a young boy, six years old in Wyoming, Bridger Walker and his two-year-old sister were visiting a neighbor friend. And in the course of their play, their friend, them took, friend took them out into the backyard where their two service dogs were kept. And as he brought them into the yard, he said, now that's the nice dog and that's the mean dog. And it, almost as if on cue, the dog charged at them barking furiously. Bridger didn't think twice. He simply moved to the side and stepped between his sister and this barking dog. But the dog kept on coming. And he started trying to get around Bridger, uh, barking furiously. Okay, uh, Bridger just moved to the side and kept himself between his sister and the dog and then suddenly the dog changed its focus and it leaped onto Bridger, grabbed him by the face and started pawing at him furiously. Even with the dog latched onto his face, all Bridger could scream was, run, run sister, run! And then just as abruptly, the dog released Bridger and retreated to the other side of the, the yard. Bridger grabbed his sister and ran as far away from the doctor as he could, could get them. The adults in the house heard the screams and the barking and came out and saw what was happening and collared the dog and then called 911 because the dog in latching on to Bridger's face had almost ripped his cheek off. He had a huge laceration to his face and the clawing, of, clawing that had been going on, his left eye was almost, well, it was swollen shut. We probably never would have heard about this story. I mean, who's been to Wyoming? Do you know anybody in Wyoming? Okay, but his aunt, Bridger's aunt, posted on Instagram a picture, well, I have a hummingbird here interrogating me, okay, um, posted a picture on Instagram of his lacerations after he got back from the hospital and had 90 stitches in his face, and she said, told the story and said, um, you know, I, I know this is a, a a long shot, but you know, when he got home, we asked him, Bridger, why did you do that? And Bridger said, Well, I figured if someone had to die, it might as well be me. Well, that, if you aren't familiar with, with that, that's almost a direct quote from uh, Captain America in one of his, one of the, the Avenger movies. And, uh, Bridger's aunt posted posted this on Instagram, and she said, I know this is a long shot, but I, I'd just like to reach out to the Avengers and, and, and let them know that there's another one amongst their ranks. Well, <laughs> the story went viral, and in less than 24 hours, the, the actor who plays, plays Captain America had responded, uh, telling Bridger how brave and heroic he was and welcoming the, him to the ranks of superheroes 
and the the Hulk got on there, and other Avenger Avenger personalities got on there. Okay. What does it take to be a savior? It takes putting yourself in harm's way. Not once, not twice, but consistently until the job's done, until people are safe. You know, in this last week, I have watched hundreds of healthcare workers here in Southern Illinois do exactly that. The third wave of COVID is coming crashing down on us, but with a difference. You see, this time we understand the disease a lot better. There's still surprises. You know, yesterday we found out that the Delta variant is affecting people who have been vaccinated just as much as it's affecting those who haven't, uh, which is brand new information. And it kind of, once again, we're having to adjust to a changing, changing scenario. It's easy to find fault and and be uncertain. But we know a lot more about the disease this time as healthcare workers. We know what to expect when people get sick. We still don't have good treatments, but we do have some. But there's a big difference. You see, this time our health systems are crippled. About 30% of hospital beds cannot be filled. They sit empty because there are no nurses to take care of the patients. Ambulances are sitting parked in parking lots while people are needing to be transferred or, or picked up because there's no, there are no EMT crews to staff them. There are many reasons why all of a sudden we have a shortage of workers. Healthcare workers were some of the hardest hit during the first two waves of COVID. Many of them died. Others are still dealing with long COVID and are unable to work. Others have aged out of the system or succumbed to other diseases. And many students have dropped out of nursing school, out of EMT training, because they discovered that they hadn't counted the cost of what it meant to be a healthcare worker. It's kind of like um, when the Gulf War st started and all of a sudden people who had accept accepted um, money from the government to pay for their medical degrees uh, suddenly were faced with the fact that they were going to be in harm's way and they were very unhappy with it they hadn't counted the cost same things happening in healthcare and it's not just nurses and doctors and EMTs um, hospitals across the area or the nation are, are experiencing staff shortages which are severely handicapping them in responding to this wave of COVID. And yet, there's still this thin red line of healthcare workers who are responding. Some of them are amazing, okay? I know nurses who work during the day in clinics who have never worked a day in the hospital, but at night they're coming in voluntarily to help pass meds or do whatever they can to help the nurses who are standing there, that thin red line. I know administrators who are <clears throat> stepping away from their desks, changing bedpans, carrying messages, doing whatever they can to support their nursing staff and their doctors. And I know doctors who are continuing to care for people even as families scream at them and swear at them for claiming that grandpa has a disease that doesn't exist in their minds. And worse yet, telling them that he's dying from it. 
and yet the doctors continue to compassionately and faithfully take care of patients. Now, I'm speaking from my own experience. This is my context. These are the heroes that I observe. And this is very real, very present. There's nothing theoretical about this. And for the people in the Bible, this touchstone of an ever-present Savior. That's the title of the Bible guide that we were studying this week. An ever-present Savior. This touchstone was just as real to them. In the Old Testament, every time you went to church, there were sacrifices. And I'm not talking about the offering plate, okay? I'm talking about animals being killed. You see, in the Old Testament, if you realized that you had broken God's law, that you had sinned, that you had lied, you had stolen, you had harmed your neighbor, you were asked to come to church with an animal. If you were rich and important, you brought a cow. If you were you know, middle middle class, then it was a sheep or a goat, okay? If you were poor, it was just a dove. But everyone came with an animal, and when you confessed your sin to God and asked forgiveness from God and from the community, you had to slit the throat of the animal or twist the head off the dove and the blood spilled out and the animal was burnt. This is gory stuff. It's so alien to our experience in church today and yet it was central to the spiritual lives of people in the Old Testament. Not just Jews. Many cultures had sacrifices. The difference with the Jewish sacrifices is they were not looked upon as offering food to the gods or as a bribe to get the gods to do something for you. The sacrifices that the Jews offered confronted them with two inconvenient truths. Sin, injustice, always inflicts suffering and leads to death, not only for the victim, but for the perp. You see, every time that we sin, every time that we commit injustice, we harm ourselves. The second inconvenient truth was that our human answers to sin, to injustice, are all incomplete and flawed and ineffective. That is a really bitter pill for all of us, believe me. It's very easy for us to feel like if that's the truth, then are you saying we should just give up? No, I'm not, okay? But I'm wanting, what I'm saying is, well, <laughs> I've lived in nations where the penalty for stealing was cutting off your hand. There were still thieves. Here in America, um, if you're caught stealing or using a weapon, in a robbery, then you go to prison and you do your time. And when you get out, you're prescribed, forbidden to work in certain industries. In fact, many employers will not even hire you because if you'll do that, how can we trust you not to do it again? It's a, it's a harsh penalty 
that we inflict on thieves. Does it stop thievery? No. <laughs> my mom used to make my brother and I wash our mouths out with soap. Okay? I can still remember putting the bar of soap in my mouth and rubbing it around. Ah! Oh, I hated that. Okay? We had to do that if we were caught lying, no matter whether it was a big lie or a little lie. We had to do that if we were talked back and were disrespectful to our mother or our father or our teachers. Uh, we had to do that when we used bad words. We didn't know very many, but, you know, sometimes you just wanted to say a bad word because you were so angry. <laughs> Was it effective? I hated it, okay? And yet the fact that I can remember doing it multiple times, yeah, that's proof enough for me that it wasn't effective. The Bible offers a different solution. That sacrifice was not just a symbol of the pain and suffering that injustice causes. It was a symbol of what it costs to bring injustice to an end, to be a savior. It always costs. And the God of the Bible says, I will bear that cost. In the New Testament, we're told that Jesus bore that cost when he went to Calvary. It doesn't explain how or why it worked, okay? Many people think that it's because God is having to prove that his government is legitimate. You know, <laughs> if the government just shot everybody who broke a lot, a law, you know, pretty soon, um, I think people would rebel. They would, okay? Because if the government sh just shot everybody that disagreed with them, we recognize that that government is unfair and unjust. And so we rebel. It may happen soon, it may happen later, but in the end, it always leads to rebellion. God's not trying to... to suppress one rebellion just to have it pop up another in another place. He's trying to do away with the whole problem of sin and injustice permanently. And to do that, well, we have to agree that the job's been done and that he's right and that we trust him. Do you trust God? The New Testament goes on to say that Jesus didn't step back and <clears throat> throw back his shoulders and look around at the applause after he went back to heaven from the cross. No, the job's not done. The job will not be done for Jesus until every one of us is safe. And the book of Hebrews in the Bible is all about what Jesus is doing right now up in heaven. And, you know, usually we think about him up there pleading with God to forgive us and to, um, to not destroy humanity. And is that what he's doing? Well, undoubtedly, okay, he cares about us. But I think he's doing much more than that. I think he's up there recruiting, okay, and organizing and marshalling resources, doing everything he can to reach your heart and mine, to protect us as much as he can from the harm that injustice wrecks in this world. He's still a savior in action. And he calls every one of us to the same thing. You see, Jesus, the Bible says that God so loved the world that he sent his son into harm's way. Jesus said, greater love hath no man 
than this, that he lay down, lays down his life for his brother. That's the kind of love that Christians are called to have for each other, to have for their neighbors, to have for their enemies, to have for the people they call sinners. And it's not just a love that they speak, it's a love that they show. It's a love that's not ashamed or revulsed by people in prison. It's a love that doesn't fear or blame the poor. It's a love that puts words into action touching untouchable lives with compassion and eagerness, stepping into harm's way to defend, to comfort, to encourage people that our society says, says are hopeless. But there's always a price to pay. And that's something that we as Christians really, really don't like. We want the applause. We want people to think of us as good. But no greater love exists than this. That a man will give his life for another. Whether you're facing a dog or COVID injustice or any of the myriad of sins that just have infiltrated this world. There is a Savior. And He calls you to be one too. Be safe, my friends. Please be prudent. But above all, keep looking up. I'll see you next week.